Good afternoon, everybody. I've got some pictures for you to bring this to life a little bit. All we're about, really, from the Forest Green Rover's point of view, is we want to make a difference. We want to try and create something that is very, very different to the norm. And we all know that if we can do that little bit by standing out, and how we do that is being bold, being brave, believing in what you want to do. For us, it's almost as if nothing is impossible. We are very lucky. Uh, the founder of Ecotricity, who has invested in Forest Green Rovers, is a real entrepreneur, a real visionary. He wouldn't describe himself as a, a business person whatsoever. He started out with very little, but he believes and sees that it's possible to make change. And he set out originally to... Uh, fight climate change. That was, that's what it was all about. So Ecotricity is the beginning of this story. Uh, he set out 22 years ago to build windmills. He started with one, um, and that enabled him to create energy, generate energy that he could sell to customers and build more and more. And that was all about starting a sort of revolution. It was more or less kicking, kick-starting the green, green energy revolution. To start with, it's all about changing the way energy is produced and used in the UK, but he saw very quickly there was a need to look at the bigger picture. And today, we would talk about a Green Britain vision, one that's tackling first and foremost energy, but also transport and the food. Energy, transport and food, the choices that nearly everyone has to make around some shape or form every single day. So for us, it's about breaking that down to something quite simple, quite easy, quite accessible for everybody to get involved with. So we are a business that's quite different. We're not, and it was very interesting to hear talks earlier today, we're not profit-driven. We actually are purpose-driven. That's not to say we're not doing brilliantly. We have a 126 million turnover, that's not bad. But what we're doing is in reinvesting that money back into doing good things. Uh, largely, that's building more energy resources. It's looking at how we support uh, the conservation, more preservation of, of energy through battery storage. But we're also looking at other bigger, bigger projects that can have a big impact across all of our lifestyles and the way that we do things. So what do we do from that perspective? Well, we started our life, as we say, around building a lot of windmills. So we have about, uh, I think it's 76 windmills across the country now that are generating energy. But we didn't stop there. We also have an electric highway, as we describe it. So that's about, uh, we were the first to install electric charging points across all the motorway service network. network. That provides the opportunity for people to charge their vehicles when they're stopping and wanting to go on long journeys. Dale did that because he believed it was the right thing to do. Not many people would have gone down that route of investing so early on in that stage. It was started in 2011. We then go into food. So bizarrely, as an energy company, we are involved with food as well. Um, and this is an image of our very iconic cube high that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. This is sold at Forest Green Rovers Football Club. This was a kind of kickstart into changing the food that might be supplied at the club. This is the club. It is the most beautiful club. Uh, it's a grassroots club, started as a grassroots club, started 129 years ago. In 2010, which was the year that I joined Ecotricity and joined Dale to do all sorts of things, I actually joined to learn about green energy um, and was rather um, shocked to be propelled into the football world as well. Um, but what we did was we took this club that was literally on the hill, not far from where, De where Dale lives, not far from where Ecotricity is in Stroud, uh, and we decided that we could get involved and help in quite a different way. Initially, the club just needed a bit of help, needed a bit of finance, really, uh, to, to pay the players, just to get things moving along a bit. Uh, but what Dale found was the, the fascination around something that actually was very different to his day-to-day -day work, but something that we could actually implement some of the ethos that we practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So this club sits on the top of a hill in Nailsworth. It's really hard to get to. 
Everyone who comes to a football game has to struggle to get up a hill. You see the away fans arrive and they get off the bus and they think they're going to troop down to the pub. They get down to the pub and it takes ages for them to walk back up again and they regret that. Uh, but there are very many nice things about where we are. Um, most importantly, actually, it's within a community of only 6,000 people who live in Nailsworth. So they're slightly taken aback by the world's interest in this club and what we're doing. So what are we doing? So we did, as soon as we got involved in the club, and even before I knew he was going to do it, Dale decided to take red meat off the menu. That's because he's been vegan since he was 15. He felt it was really a good opportunity to change the way that we provide food in, a, in an environment where it would be the average burger, sausage roll, hot dog, whatever it might be, but not in the sense of being vegan. So we first of all changed the menu. We then looked at our energy supply. So the energy supply, um, a windmill that's just literally up the road from where the club is, is the very first one that Dale ever built. So it was very apt that we were in a situation where we could point to that windmill and actually create a situation where it started to power the club. We then installed the solar panels that you see here. They're on the top of a, a stand, so you'll never see them if you come to the ground. Uh, but we do have a little set that when you first come in into the gate, you would see them there. So we started that sort of what can we do? How can we implement more green things? We made the pitch an organic pitch. Um, and what we've done there is we've actually bought in all the equipment that you might use. It's now battery stored, stored, stored. so it's all battery um, uh, uh, managed. So everything that we do is then powered by the sun to actually make the, the, all the equipment to work properly. Uh, we obviously have food. Uh, we've changed our food. Uh, we've put electric charging points into the ground so people who come to the ground can have to charge their vehicles, and that can be any time of the week, it doesn't have to be on a match day, it could be any time, but it does encourage a slightly different way of people coming into the ground. And as I say, we've got the food, this is our Christmas food, uh, but we have the most amazing menu of vegan food, very much like today's lunch, which I thought was absolutely amazing, hopefully we'll agree with that, it was absolutely lovely. Um, constantly changing that, we have our own in-house chef who's creating this food that is the lowest carbon emission. So again, food is a really important thing that you can change um, and have an impact on the environment. So we've moved things along really successfully in that, in that guise. And then what happened? Oh my goodness. So we'd been in what's called the National League for a long time, conference actually it was called, um, before the National League. So it's kind of below D Division 4 if you're not into football. And I don't even know why I say that, because a lot of people might not even remember the all the different divisions. But uh, we had for years and years been in this conference league, and it's very difficult to get out of. So now you have to put your kind of football hat on if anyone's into football. Is anyone into football? Can't really see you very well, so don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so basically... Um, we had struggled. We'd been in this, in this particular division, this league, for quite some time. We'd started to change players, which is an important part. We had had some changes of management. And we were starting to creep up to the top of the league, of the conference, uh, the National League, um, to the point that we were in playoffs, which means that you can, if you're near the top, you can be automatically promoted into the next league, or you have to fight your corner to get up there. Uh, we did our playoff. We went to Wembley um, a couple of years ago, uh, and very sadly, we didn't get through. But we were all completely in awe of the fact that we got to Wembley. This little club that probably we brought about two and a half, three thousand fans, and we played Grimsby that year, and I think they brought about fifteen thousand. So we were really kind of the minnows in that situation. The next year, we come back in. We played well throughout the season. And we were in the playoffs again, and we went to Wembley. And Dale and I went with, our, obviously, everybody that's sort of supporting the club. It was a, a very surreal situation. Um, we had Vivian Westwood. We had Jilly Cooper who supports us. All these kind of eclectic mix of fans, some of whom weren't quite sure what they were doing there, to be honest. Um, and we, we played, um, on this occasion, Tranmere Rovers. Um, and we won, and none of us could actually believe that we'd won. It was just absolutely phenomenal. This is an image of the excitement from the players, but I have to say we were in shock that we'd got to this situation. 
absolutely amazing. Small club, doing things differently, and all of a sudden, we're in League Two, English Football League, which might not sound like anything, but boy, when you get into that league, there's suddenly an awful lot to do, and you're part of a, a league with 72 clubs in total, all working to obviously promote themselves as far as they can, um, a lot more exposure than you'd ever imagine. So why? Why do we do all these things? Why have we got to this point where we decided to make those changes to actually bring our ethos into the football club? Well, I think we, in honesty, did it because why wouldn't we? Uh, it was something that we believe in, something that we could do quite easily. Uh, we found it an interesting experience. We knew it was going to be very different to anything anyone else had done. But most importantly, it was just simply because we wanted to do it. Um, what actually happened as a result was quite astonishing. We had such phenomenal interest. Uh, we hit the headlines. When we first got into the league and we played our first game, I think when we even got the draw of who we were playing against our very first games, uh, all the press came to see us. And the imagination was that they were coming to talk about football, that we were a little club and that we'd we'd managed to get into the English Football League. But in reality, they were coming also because we were very, very different. As it happened at the start of that season, I was taking on a CEO, so I was female in football, and there's not very many of us that were doing that at the time, still isn't, um, although it's getting better. Um, but more than anything, this club was actually attracting a lot of attention. And I have to say, throughout all the times that I've met other club representatives, I go to meetings at the English Football League, there's always been this real strong kind of interest in why we're different. I sat next to somebody quite some time ago now from Millwall who said to me, we were in a meeting where the English Football League tell you what to do. And she said, wouldn't it be great if they just told us all that we had to be green? And I was thinking, Millwall, wow, <laughs> that's interesting. That's what was happening. People were going, how are you getting so much interest? How are you getting so much media? So we've had people from Al Jazeera, we've had HBO from the States, we've had so much coverage. Um, from the start when we hit the big time and we, we, you know, the dream came true, to very recently, as Neil was saying, we got uh, the accolade of being the first football club to have a UN climate, change, uh, climate um, uh, stand, uh, standards. So we'd really, really worked hard, but we hadn't done it for any re other reason than we really liked what we were doing. But the, it's endless. We had Saturday Kitchen with us the other day. We had Jamie Oliver coming to do a program the other day, largely about food, but also it's a really interesting thing. It's a different environment. We're engaging with a lot of people. We're engaging on generally on a, a, a match day at home. We'll get about 2,700, 3,000 people, gate numbers of people who have come to a football match, and they are experiencing something. It's not really shoved down their throats at all. They're just coming and enjoying. Some people literally come because they like the food. They don't even watch the match. It's just amazing. These people are coming. It's a very family-focused uh, club, so we get lots and lots of families who come through. They'll just join. They tend to all come quite early. So compared to other clubs where you'll go to an away match, people will rock up not that far be you know, before the actual start of the game. People come hours earlier. And that's not just because they're trying to find somewhere to park. I think it's literally, it seems, that they, they really enjoy the environment, which is half the battle, really. So we are making some good headway. One of the things that we do is we try to talk to as many people as possible. Um, one of the things I started about three years ago was a kind of engagement, community engagement program. It's quite common for a, a football club to do community engagement, normally around football, not making food, which is what we do. So we, make, we bring school groups in, they can make the food that we eat on a match day. So they get the chance to make the food that the, our, our guests would have, our players might be eating, just learn a little bit about vegan food. It's not pressurizing them to change, but just opening their eyes, really, to different things. We engage with them around soccer camps. We engage them around, we, you know, we do shirt giveaways so the children can come and actually experience the, get, to, to experience the match, come and experience the, the whole ethos of what we're doing. Um, we have an ambassador program. We have around 70 schools now that work with us, and each has someone in the school 
who is talking about the club, but we give them information about how we're green. And then they share that with their people within the school. They write things in the program for us. It's just ripple effect of interest around all the things that we're doing, which is always really exciting. I guess the question is, are we really weird, different? Is it possible to do it in any other way? Um, does, can everybody do it? Um, and we think they can. And I think probably the secret to that is thinking about breaking things down to being as simple as they possibly can. Um, there certainly has to be belief in what you want to do. Um, and actually, when you speak to Dale, um, if you say, we did talk about, you know, shall we go vegan? Shall we, shall we just put a few vegan, vegan things in? I knew what the answer was going to be. No, we're going to be 100% vegan. Um, and it did take us a little while. Uh, we didn't do that transformation until 2015. We were vegan for a lot longer than people realized. We just didn't tell people. And the only thing that sort of changed at the very end was needing to take the cow's milk off uh, you know, and take that away and supplement that for something else. And people were a little bit anxious about that anxious about how they communicate that. So our people who do all the serving of food and drink was going, or wanted to be quite apologetic about the fact that there was no cow's milk. And I was like, no, you don't need to do that. You just say, do you want soya? Do you want rice milk? Do you want oatly? Um, and that sort of changed, and it was a more positive conversation, which meant people were like, oh, yeah, um, I'll either have one of those or I'll have it black. But actually, no one complained. They just kept going. They've kept all the way through being part of our way of doing things, which has been really interesting. They don't challenge it. Occasionally they might, and the you know, way fans will turn up and they've got inflatable sausages and burgers and all sorts of fish they wave around when they're in the ground, because you know, that, that's, that's the way. I'm not eating that rubbish, and then they'll go and queue up in the outlets and three or four times over, and if there's nothing else they can eat, they'll eat chips forever and a day. So it's not like they're gonna starve. Um, but, it is about having that belief. It is knowing that actually if you want to do something, you really can do it. I would say people talk to us endlessly about how to start this. We went to the UN. Dale and I went out to um, Germany to have some conversations for prior to the COP meetings in November. And everyone was wanting to sit around the table going, you know, what kind of framework are we going to have? What guidance do we need to put together? And Dale being Dale is just sitting there going, well, just get on with it. Um, and actually, that is the best way because everyone has got their particular way of doing things. Everyone is using things in a different way. So if you are more involved with transport, you might do more things around transport. If you've got lots of people working for you who are driving in, you might want to provide electric charging points. You might want to encourage different ways of travel. If you're providing food, you might want to start to shift the menu a little bit because out in the big wide world, menus are shifting. So it's just simply happening. So there are easy ways of getting involved. Importantly, engage. And that's, I know, the hardest thing in the world. Everyone's wanted in the sustainability world to know and understand how to shift behavior change. But if you make it fun, people will talk about it. They'll encourage their friends to do it. And you've got that ripple effect. If you impose on people, and I'm the worst one in the world, I don't like being told what to do, and Dell certainly doesn't. So between us, we make a good pair. But if you engage people in something that they really want to get involved with, and perhaps football is a nice platform, a very different way of doing things, it can have a very positive effect. We also need to listen. We need to listen to what people are saying, what their struggles are, what they're, what they're wanting to do. And that's all about that collaboration that we talked about earlier. That's amazingly important. We do work with a lot and lot of organizations. We work with sponsors that you know, aren't your average sponsor of a, of a sporting a venue. We do things in a different way. We're trying to encourage people to hear what others are doing as well, so we share those stories. And also, we speak to everyone, and that means we've got to have different messages for different people. So we've got the young people that we work with, we've got the, the older, we've got die-hard fans who've gone, what on earth have you done, Dale? But actually, we quite like it. When you hear them talk about what we're doing, that is phenomenal. That's when you know you've cracked it because they've lived a different life. They do remember some of the things, the memorable stuff that we all want to remember about the good times. They do get it and they are starting to process that and communicate it to others. 
And I think the most important thing is work together because you can't do it on your own. We think big. This is our new stadium. We hope to build that, Junction 13 of the M5 one day. More fans. Got to keep going up the table. We need to get to League One next. So that will take a little while. We will never stop, and we hope nobody will. No, it's not great to start an initiative and, and then not keep it going. Uh, one thing for us is we're introducing FGL food for schools. So we'll be producing food that will go into schools that is vegan, that is different and exciting. And I think the big thing is we would just recommend just go for it because there are things you can all do and every little bit really will make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you, Helen.